In the summer of 1978, rumors began circulating amongst residents living in the small community of Viter, Texas, that a werewolf was on the loose. As some local teens had spoken of seeing a strange shaggy-haired creature lurking in the forest. While most people merely laughed it off, some were a little more concerned. On the night of June 19, 1978, things would come to a head when Bobby Bussinger went out to investigate some strange noises on his property. Instead of the usual woodland pest, he was confronted by something out of his scope of understanding. Something he had been told doesn't exist. Join me as I delve into the Viter Werewolf. In 1978, 20-year-old Bobby Bussinger, a construction worker at the Goodyear Synthetic Complex near Beaumont, and his 18-year-old wife Becky, had begun noticing strange things around their home on North Tram Road in Viter, Texas. The previous tenant of the house, Bobby's father, had left because he had a bad feeling about the place, which was only exasperated by the strange howling and yelping he heard from the woods on the back side of the property. He would also claim that some nights he would see a dark hairy figure lurking around outside. Sometimes it would even claw at the windows. He eventually threw in the towel and moved out. It was late February. Bobby and Becky, married only two weeks, offered to move in and care for the property. The young couple had heard the rumors of a werewolf that some locals had seen along North Tram Road. They also had heard the stories from Bobby's father, but they brushed it off as just an oversized forest critter being a nuisance. Speaking to Texas Leader newspaper reporter John Rice from her parents' home in Beaumont, Becky acknowledged that after moving in, things were fine. At first, but Sunday night, she told him. That's when things changed. On the morning of Monday, June 19, 1978, Bobby had done his routine check of his property and discovered that one of his eight dogs was missing and two of them had been maimed in the hindquarters and died. All three were puppies of mixed breed. Later that night, after the sun had set, Bobby and his wife heard a commotion like, quote, a good-sized dogfight outside their house. There was banging on the walls of the house, rapping on the windows, heavy footfalls were heard, and an eerie barking and yelping filled the air. Armed with a 12 gauge shotgun, Bobby set off towards their back lot, using the light from the full moon to see. He walked to the edge of the clear lot and was confronted by something that shook him to his core. Standing there was a dark, well-built, shaggy-haired creature. It was, Bobby guessed, around six and a half feet tall and weighed between 200 and 250 pounds. The creature seemed to stare at him and then began to come towards him aggressively. The creature either did not realize that he had a rifle in his hand, or if it did, it didn't care. It came at him so fast that Bobby became instantly frightened. In a panic, he fired off around in the creature's direction before turning and running back towards the house. The creature followed closely behind, and Bobby admitted that he just barely made it to the house. He was certain that, had he not reached home, the creature would have almost certainly attacked him. His wife, watching from inside, held the door open until he ran inside, and she quickly slammed it and locked it. The creature bounded up onto the porch, slamming into the door. It seemed to go crazy, attacking the door, the windows, and tearing out the screens, all while howling and yelping like an injured dog. The pounding, screaming, and clawing at the window continued for several minutes, and Bobby called the sheriff's office. They could only sit and watch as the creature attacked their house, sometimes attempting to peer inside. A terrifying sight. At 11.30 p.m., Sheriff's Deputy Jack Reeves received the call to investigate a prowler at the Bussinger residence. After arriving, he talked to the Bussingers, 
Judging by how panicked they seemed, he decided that the situation was quite serious and began walking out towards the timber line. This is where he heard growling and howling in the distance. It sounded like a cross between the noise a hyena makes and that of an injured dog, Reeves told reporter John Rice. As he entered the woods, the sounds came further and further away, and he realized that the creature had moved off deeper into the woods. He eventually returned to the house and spoke to Bobby and Becky. He observed that four window screens were ripped from the house, with many of the frames broken. He also observed the two deceased dogs. Speaking to John Rice, Reeves noted that the situation at the Bussinger's home that night was, quote, extremely serious, and that he had seen the screens torn out by, quote, somebody's bare hands. According to Reeves, after speaking to the Bussingers, he returned to his patrol car. He proceeded to drive a block away and wait for the Prowler's return. As he sat in his car, he got a radio message that something was at the back of the Bussingers' home, scratching and banging on the windows. He had only been gone for five minutes. When he drove into the Bussingers' driveway, the Prowler had backed off again, but Reeves saw it at about 50 yards a large form between two small oak trees. He quickly shone the spotlight on it and watched as it moved into the woods. As the sheriff sat outside their home watching for the creature, Bobby and Becky were inside packing their belongings. They loaded up their items and pets and drove into Beaumont with Reeves. Becky's parents agreed to let them stay until the situation at home was sorted out. The Bussingers agreed that their one-story frame home would stand vacant until the Prowler was caught. I'm not going anywhere near that place until they find it, whatever it is, Becky told Rice. Apparently it didn't last though because the couple returned home the very next night. The creature was again observed by the couple at 8 a.m. that Wednesday morning. Reeves jokingly told reporters that he had not ordered any silver bullets but he had spoken with his superiors and that they were setting up a stakeout to watch the property. I was pretty skeptical and so was Bussinger, but it's gotten pretty serious with the property destruction and now the dogs. One area of interest, at the edge of the Bussinger's cleared property, a footpath led through the three acres of heavy timber. Becky often walked that path in search of berries. She was certain that the thing used the path quite frequently as it was well worn. She told Reeves that during one of her walks, she saw a lean-to in the distance at the far edge of the timbered area. It had been put together with scrap lumber and three tree limbs. She thought it was odd but brushed it off. On Wednesday, June 21, 1978, Sheriff's officers in a six-man team headed by Reeves and joined by County Poundmaster Albert Adams, scoured the dense undergrowth near North Tram Road, searching for the werewolf, as the press had dubbed it. The Bussingers claimed that they had seen the creature again that very morning at 8 a.m., prior to the arrival of the officers. If searching for a werewolf wasn't enough, all through the night and into the day, officers were inundated with carloads of rowdy curiosity seekers joyriders and drunken rabble-rousers, all of whom were hoping to catch a glimpse of the werewolf. Sheriff Ed Parker insisted that people stay away, as some of the curious had arrived at the location intoxicated and armed. If they don't watch out, they'll shoot each other or this prowler. In either case, they'll be in big trouble if that happens, he told reporters. By that afternoon, Reeves, seemingly desperate to quash any talk of a werewolf and calm the public, indicated to the press that they had a suspect in mind. If it's the man we think it is, he's been in Rusk State Mental Hospital before, and from what I hear, it will take five or six men to bring him in. It is unclear what became of the Viter werewolf, or the escaped mental patient, if you believe Reeves. There was no follow-up that I could find. I have to assume, had Reeves actually managed to capture someone, the creature, they would have touted it in the news, but there was nothing, at least nothing that I could find. 
Interestingly, within five years, Vider would be visited by yet another strange phenomenon. In late July and into June 1983, residents living in the small community began seeing a bizarre glowing object, almost on a nightly basis. 52-year-old Dolores Cherry, her nephew Byron Cole, her sisters Joanne McIntyre and Wilma Cole, and Cole's two daughters, claimed to have observed it hovering at midnight in the Sandra Lane area. Speaking to David Widener of the Beaumont Enterprise newspaper for an article published on June 7, 1983, Cherry indicated that she and McIntyre had first spotted it 10 days earlier. It seemed to be following them as they drove west on Interstate 10, returning from Orange. It eventually disappeared at Farm Road 105. After that, it would show up periodically. Cherry herself observed it at least four times over that week. They claimed that the object resembled a star and had three pointed protrusions similar to points on a star. At first I thought it was a great big silver star, Cherry told Widener. It's really weird. I'd just really like to know what it is. It puts off red and blue vapor and has a glow around it at times, but it makes no noise. Another relative, Georgette Cole, finally reported the sighting on the night of Sunday, June 5th. My husband went out to get some cigarettes from the car and spotted it, Cole reported. There were about 14 of us at my grandmother's house. No one wanted to report it because they knew they would get laughed at. I decided to do it, so I called the Vider police. Cole told Widener that the object she saw appeared to be round and sparkled all around. Vider Patrol Officer David Watson responded to the call and remained on the scene for 30 minutes. In my opinion, it was clouds passing in front of a really bright star, Watson told Widener. It would be real bright, then it seemed to disappear. He eventually left the area. The strangest aspect of the sighting was yet to come. McIntyre claims that they continued to watch the object. It began to move sideways and up and down remaining in the area until a helicopter arrived on the scene. They both disappeared then, McIntyre told Widener. She and the others assumed that it was a police helicopter sent to investigate, but they weren't sure. All I could see was the lights, but it looked and sounded like a helicopter. It was moving slow like one. Fighter Police Chief Butch Reynolds confirmed that an officer had been sent to the scene, but acknowledged that they had not received any calls about strange lights prior to that Sunday night. He also confirmed that the Texas Highway Patrol did have a helicopter that they were able to dispatch from Houston when needed, but a spokesman told them that one was not sent to the scene on that night. Harold Edwards, the air traffic control tower manager at the airport, told Widener, Our log indicates nothing unusual showing up on radar at the time of the sighting. Our radar will not show or pick up anything below 1,000 feet altitude, so it's possible something may have been in that area. We only work helicopters that are landing or coming into our airport. Fred Wesley was on duty at the National Weather Service when the call came in about a UFO at 10.30 p.m. I checked the Lake Charles and Galveston radars, and there was no unusual sightings, he told Widener. The weather was mostly clear at the time with visibility for seven miles, so one of the airports would have had to pick up any aircraft in that area, but apparently they didn't. Wesley also indicated that no weather balloons were in the area on that Sunday night. So what was going on? What was the light and why did it continue to appear over the course of that week? Was it surveilling something? Also, who sent the helicopter if not the police? It seems somebody was aware of the strange object over Vider, but who? Vider continues to get its share of strangeness. On June 20, 2000, at around 1 a.m., a man driving home from work claimed that he observed a five-foot-tall red-eyed creature which was covered in black hair. A juvenile Sasquatch? He pulled his truck over and got out and shined a spotlight at it. The creature looked at him, raised its arm over its head, and growled. 
It then turned and ran behind a nearby house. Even stranger than cryptids and flying objects, in Nina Lautner's series of books Ghosts of America, she details numerous accounts of ghostly children, fog-like entities, and shadow people which have been sighted in the small town. Even the area's middle school is said to be haunted. As well, some locals have described seeing figures in dark robes engaging in strange rituals in the woods and near the Four Oaks Ranch. One reader wrote to Lautner, The cult met in the ruins of Four Oaks Ranch in the woods before it burnt down. I'm not sure if it was really a satanic group. It may have just been a coven of Wiccans. My buddy and I accidentally interrupted their ceremony one night. We weren't up to no good, just dumb teenagers out for adventure. They chased us to my truck. They carried knives and wore dark hooded cloaks. These were not kids, they were adults, and my buddy claimed he recognized one as a very prominent member of the community. I'm dubious about that, but I believed he believed it. Another person wrote, When I was an infant baby, my father attended several meetings of a secret Satanist group that used to meet in the woods of Vider at night. He only attended a few meetings and was so disturbed by what he saw, he still rarely talks about it to this day. Bigfoots, werewolves, ghosts, fog entities, shadow people, UFOs, and possibly even dangerous cults. Vider certainly seems to have a rich history of spooky strangeness. If you live in Vider or know someone who does, and you have a story to tell, please leave it in the comments.